Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this beautiful Easter morning, the uh, morning that gives us the uh, hope of uh, and promise uh, for the days ahead. Um, I would I'd like to welcome those uh, that are visiting with us today, especially those that are back from college that are visiting with us. Um, I would call your attention to the announcements that are listed in the bulletin. I do have one correction that there is no uh, deacons meeting uh, tomorrow, Monday at 5 p.m. So uh, that is uh, a misprint in the bulletin. Uh, are there other announcements? A little update on the Kids Against Hunger. At the moment, we have, uh, well, as of last Sunday, there was $1,445 contributed to the, the bulk food that's going to be packaged by members of our church and sent directly to people who are starving. That does not count the matching money from Lamont Molding. That does not count the envelope that's going through the choir loft. That does not count uh, anything that anybody else chooses to put in towards this cause. The mission committee has decided that as of May 11th, that's next month, May 11th, we should be done collecting money so that as of May 18th, we can be done signing people up who will work. The change in the date is listed out there on the clipboard. It's no longer going to be June 1st, so everyone who signed up for June 1st, if you can, come on June 8th. That's the date that they will be able to supply the bulk food for us. The people from Kids Against Hunger are not going to be able to be here to do that with us on the 1st. It's got to be on the 8th of June. But the way I see it, we're probably going to need to package a couple of days anyway, at the very minimum. And if you've got a group that has got a few days that they would like, let me know, and I'll see if I can get that arranged through Kids, Kids Against Hunger. Um, also, next week, the form is going to be an all-congregation form again. This will be a chance for you to hear a brief update on the process for the pastor search. Also, it will be a time when session members will sit at table with small groups and get feedback from the congregation as to progress. At this point, where we're going, they've, they've got information they need from you. You've been sharing information with them. They now need more information from you. That'll be next week, all congregation forum after church. Let us stand as we are able for the call to worship. This is the day.
This is the day God has. Cast the cornerstone of the past power, dispel the shadows of grief with the joy of the resurrection. This is the day that God has made. All people the same through gracious love, and given us new words to speak to a weary world. This is the day of resurrection. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Sin clings to us as if, it, as if we were its most precious possession. But just as death's grip on Jesus was broken on that first morning, so God will release us from the grasp of sin. Let us confess to the one who offers us resurrection life as we pray together, saying, On this first day of the week, as on all other days, God of our lives, we confess, we wander in the shadows of temptation. Ignoring the life you offer to us, we are asked to proclaim the good news of life anew, but continue to speak the old words of despair. You would anoint us with the Holy Spirit, but we have the umbrellas of fear to keep it from touching us. You hear our prayers, God, and these through joy, and you answer us with forgiveness. On this morning, give us the life. On this day, we are transformed from mourners into witnesses of the resurrection. In the days to come, we will run to share the good news that Jesus, our Lord and Savior, is alive in our midst. 
Let us unite our hearts in an assurance of pardon. Joy replaces grief. Hope overcomes despair. Life triumphs over death. This is the good news of the day. We are the people of Easter, singing glad songs of hope and promise. Thanks be to God. We are forgiven. Thank you, choir. Thank you for your beautiful proclamation this morning. Thanks to those of you who came just today, came from school or visiting with friends or family and have come to be a part of the choir making the proclamation. Thank you for your good word, your joy in this Easter day. Our reading this morning comes from the book of John, from John's Gospel. Jesus, the one who was crucified, his body has been taken from the cross. It has been given to Joseph of Arimathea. 
And he and a rabbi, a teacher of the law, a religious leader by the name of Nicodemus, they have quickly prepared Jesus' body for burial and placed it in a garden tomb. Now as we come to our reading this morning, now it is early on the first day of the week. Now it is in that moment where night and day meet. Now, Mary has come. She has come to do the hard work of grieving. She has come to cry. She has come to share her sadness and her hurt. Let us pray as we now come to the tomb. Lord of life, we ask that you would meet us here in this place. This place between darkness and light. This place between death and life. Meet us here. And by the power of your Holy Spirit, fill us with life. New life for us today and tomorrow so that we might be filled with joy and we might be life in the midst of the world you have given us in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken our Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb Peter saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in. He saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that Jesus must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their home. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting there where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing Jesus to be a gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to Jesus in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to Mary, do not hold on to me. 
because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of God. I don't know if you noticed in John's telling of the Easter story, I don't know if you noticed how much time John spends on inviting us into the emptiness of the garden tomb. Did you notice that? John takes us with Mary Magdalene. He asks us to see that the stone that had covered the tomb, that it had been rolled back, the contents of the tomb now released. He asks us to hear Mary's message to, to the disciples, to Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved. The Lord is not there. I don't know if you notice how much time John spends in his gospel inviting us to experience the emptiness of that garden tomb. He has us join this foot race with Peter and the other disciple. He has us peek inside the tomb as that Beloved disciple gets there first and sees the grave clothes laying on the floor. He has us enter the tomb with Peter to see the grave clothes, to see the emptiness, to know in our heads and our hearts that Jesus is not there. I don't know if you notice how much time John spends in making sure that we are aware that Easter Sunday, that the Easter story begins with emptiness. Oftentimes, when I am with people who are grieving the death of a loved one. They talk to me about this kind of emptiness, I think. They tell me about the hole that they feel, they feel, the, the void that is there. They, they tell me about this, this emptiness that, that controls their lives in a way. This emptiness that keeps them from feeling any kind of joy or happiness. This emptiness that, that keeps them from even experiencing feeling love or kindness. They talk about this emptiness that is all-consuming. The truth is that grief is just one of the kinds of emptinesses that we experience as human people, isn't it? The truth is there's all kinds of emptiness that each and every one of us carry with us. Oh, we don't like to talk about it, especially on Easter morning. We like to cover it up, put on our happy face. But there are all kinds of emptinesses that we carry with us. The uncertainty about the future, our work, our finances, our health, the insecurities that we carry about ourselves. Are we enough? Do I have what it takes to be a good mom, a good dad? a good husband, a good wife, a good friend, a good worker? 
Will I have what it takes to be successful in this world? There's all kinds of emptinesses that each and every one of us walk with every day. I was talking with a woman this week. She's a bright woman, professional woman. She was telling me about a trivia night. Have you ever been to one of those trivia nights? You sit around in tables, groups of people, gathering, collaborating on all the answers, eating food, having a great time. And that's what she was telling me, how much fun she had. She named all the people she sat with. She talked about all the food that they ate. She talked about all the fun that they had. And she said to me, she said, Bill, you know what? She said, I almost didn't go. She said, I was afraid that somebody would think that I was dumb. And there was just like that. I mean, we were talking about fun and having a good time and friends and food. And there was the emptiness. I'm afraid, Bill, that I won't measure up. I was talking with a coworker. He was telling me that he just had his four-year scan. He'd been diagnosed with cancer four years ago. He said, every time I have one of these scans, I really get anxious, Bill. He said, I can remember back the first scan I had after my cancer went into remission. He said, I walked into the doctor's office after the scan, and the doctor said, I don't know. The scan doesn't look good. Your x-rays all lit up. And then he went on to tell me, he went on to tell me how he thought he was spiritually prepared to meet death head on. He talked to me about how he had been preparing himself through his work at hospice, how he was able to look death straight on and be okay with that reality. But then he told me about going to the doctor's office to get the follow-up from the scan, to hear what the radiologist said. And he talked to me about the moment when the doctor said, guess what? All that gunk we saw on your x-ray, it's just mucus that has formed in the lining behind your kidneys. You don't have cancer. It hasn't reoccurred. He said, Bill, I could have shouted out loud. I could have danced with joy right there. I was so excited. And I wondered to myself, was I really ready for death? There it was in the midst of his story, in the midst of the joy of getting a good diagnosis, the emptiness. Will I be enough? Will I have enough to make it? in the midst of this world. It's the emptiness that keeps Mary at the tomb this morning. It's her grief, her uncertainty. It's the hopelessness Woman, why are you weeping? I'm weeping because Jesus is gone. When he was with us, things were different. He he, he showed us how to love people just like they were. He, he, he encouraged us. He, he taught us how to live. He filled us with hope. He, he, he freed us from our past. And now, it's all gone. Woman, why are you weeping? I'm weeping because the emptiness I once knew is consuming me again. 
I, I'm afraid of falling into the despair of hopelessness. For the Jesus that gave me hope has been taken away. Mary, Rabboni. In an instant, it all changes, doesn't it? In an instant, Mary's fears, Mary's despair, Mary's anxiety, Mary's hopelessness. It is taken away by the reality of Christ's presence with her. It's all changed in a moment. I, I don't know what you believe about resurrection. I, I don't know what you believe about it. I, I don't know if you believe that, that there is a physical reality to this resurrection a heart beating, breathtaking, flesh and blood reality to Jesus' resurrection or your own. I, I don't know what you believe about it. But this is what I believe about resurrection. I believe that resurrection happens every day. I believe it is all around us. I believe that it happens every time life comes into the midst of the emptiness that indwells us so often. I believe that it is there. It is there in the life of the teenager who made horrible decisions when they were growing up, who almost dropped out of high school because of apathy, who tried to identify themselves through drug abuse, who, who, who looked to push his family away by being angry all the time. And yet, has decided to make his life count. Who has found ways to re-engage his family, to live a life filled with meaning and hope, who has worked to help his children to live differently. I, I believe that resurrection happens all the time, that it's not just something for down the road sometime when I die. I believe it happens every day that life comes out of the midst of death. I have seen it in the grieving parents who have been consumed by the grief of a child, but yet turn that grief outward sharing their story, bringing hope to other parents who are grieving. I believe in resurrection. I believe it happens all the time, all around us. It's there in the couple who have neglected their relationship for, for many years. They were busy with work or children. Things just got by. Time passed. And all of a sudden, there's a wall. They no longer know how to be with one another, but yet they go to work. And they find new ways to communicate, to care, to love one another. I believe in resurrection. I believe it happens all the time. I've seen it in the older man, who even though he's no longer able to drive, even though he can't get up the stairs anymore, even though he needs help getting to the bathroom and getting himself cleaned and dressed, he has refused to be negative. He finds something every day in the midst of life and living to be thankful for. He, he tries to be positive. He, he works at it making the best out of every situation. 
I believe that resurrection happens all the day, all the time. I've seen it in the life of a woman whose life was defined for so many years by bipolar disease and depression. Who began to tell the story of that out loud to her family and to her friends and to anyone who would hear it. And in doing so, they took away the shame of that disease. They let one another know that it was okay. I I believe that resurrection happens all the time. So here we are. Here we are. It's the first day of the week. We have come to that place to once again experience the emptiness of the tomb and to touch our own emptiness. And here, today, we have experienced the God who gives us life. who who fills our lives with hope, who eases our anxieties, who lets us know that we're enough just like we are, that we're lovable. And that's why we sing today. That's why the trumpets play. That's why we shout, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. Because today we have been given hope for the empty places of our lives. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn of response is number 118, the day of resurrection.
As we prepare for prayer this morning, I would ask if there is any prayer request to share with one another. Let us pray. You have surprised us this day, O oh God. You have surprised us. When we thought that the emptiness within us could not be taken away, you meet us with life. And you offer that life to us anew. When we thought that our self-doubt would define who we are, you said to us, I love you just the way you are. When, you, when we thought we would be defined by our sin, by our past mistakes, you set us free by your grace and mercy. You have surprised us this day, O oh God. You have given us life where there was deadness, and we offer our thanks to you this day for the hope that we receive in Easter's message that Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. So fill us with that hope. Bring life into those empty and dead places within us. Make our hearts glad. Fill us with joy. Ease our anxieties. Calm our fears. Remind us this day that we are enough because you have given us all we need in Christ Jesus. As community who gathers in this place this day to celebrate Easter, we recognize that there are people around the world who will make their Easter celebrations in the midst of fear and violence. We pray for them today that they would be filled with hope We pray today for those around this world who will make their Easter feasts with meager food. We pray, O oh God, that they might have enough. Enough simply to feed their bodies. We pray today for those around this world who have given up and given in. We pray that the message of Easter might bring hope in all parts of our world. We pray for ourselves as a community of faith here. We pray that we might give life to one another to this community that you have called us to be a part of. That we may not be defined, would not be defined by our anxieties, but by our certainties that you have given us all we need to love and to serve in your name. We pray today for those in need of healing, for Ken, for Helen, for Lennis, for Bob. We pray for those who are confined to care facilities. We pray for those who grieve. We pray, O oh God, that you would provide for each in their season of need, that you would fill their emptiness. We pray these things in the spirit of Easter that always finds life in the midst of the emptiness. 
and we pray them in the name of the Lord of life, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, Let us respond this day to the life that has been given to us by God through Jesus Christ. Let us share that life with others. Let us receive this morning's offering.
Rejoice in the Lord always. Let me say it to you again, rejoice. Do not be anxious about anything, for the Lord is near. Let your gentleness be made known to all, in all things, with prayer, with supplication, with thanksgiving in your heart. Let God know what it is you need in your prayers. And the peace of God, which surpasses our ability to understand, that peace will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus on Easter days and every day. For Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Thank you.